final chapter for America being written where its president is concerned and you're getting all the decisive coverage right here on headlines today. Now counting currently underway in the U.S. presidential elections and early trends show incumbent president Barack Obama taking the lead after lagging behind initially. Now according to the latest information, Obama leads with 78 of the electoral votes as against 71 of Republican challenger Mitt Romney. It is in fact expected to be a close call in the crucial swing state of Virginia. South Carolina is expected to go Mitt Romney's way. The latest, of course, uh, the results of these elections hang on the swing states. Ohio, right now, too close to call. Florida, too close to call. But uh, initial reports suggest will go the Obama way. Of course, Virginia, right now, reports suggest it's a neck to neck battle. Clearly, the swing states will decide who the next president of America will be. As America awaits for polls, headlines today is going to get you a decisive coverage. We've been reporting from 5 a.m. today morning, getting you the very latest. Uh, what we can say right now is that uh, Barack Obama has an edge. Initially, he was lagging behind Mitt Romney, but now it seems Barack Obama is emerging in the front right now, but only by a whisker. Let's uh, cut across to my colleague, Maruf Inayat. She's tracking developments very closely. Maruf, you know you've uh, had a couple of uh, hours where you've been working pretty much around the clock. Uh, what does it suggest, Maruf, if we look at it initially falling behind, now catching up with an edge, Obama? Uh, well, honestly, pretty, I think that's a lot of years. Then we'll have a lot of years here. We'll have a lot of years here. And what the challenge is, and what the challenge is, and it seems like one. Days is brilliant weather here in DC and the Virginia area. And what you are mentioning in terms of the initial projections that are coming in, uh, well, honestly, most of the uh, stations here in terms of uh, the kind of projections that they're seeing at the exit polls, it's too close to call. And what uh, uh, what we are seeing on the ground right now is that uh, as some posters and pundits are saying that it's anybody's game. But two states are extremely important. One is the state of Virginia which I'm very close to right now. I was uh, reporting through the day from Virginia. And the turnout has been extremely impressive, which which can at uh, this point mean either way. Either it could go uh, Barack Obama's way or uh, Romney's way. But uh, uh, going by the kind of uh, demographics that we are seeing in the voter turnout, uh, it, it uh, sells good for Barack Obama because essentially Virginia has been a Republican state, even though mm -hmm. the last time around he won the state. Right. Uh, but uh, from initial projections in Ohio and Virginia, Virginia is the state where if Mitt Romney makes it... All right, uh, Ma Maru, if you're having some trouble with your uh, video link uh, and the audio that we're getting through, of course, we would be coming back to you for further updates. But as uh, Maruk is suggesting, of course, it uh, boils down to the swing state because these are the states which will decide the president of America. Right now, of course, uh, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, Wisconsin, Colorado, Pennsylvania, too close to call. Continuous coverage right here, but let's cut across uh, to what Al Jazeera, the international channel, is reporting on the election. Cases of which way it's going, but it's, it's a very small snowball. It is. Right I'm just, I'm, I'm waiting for every little bit of data at the moment so I can bring you something. We've been a bit quiet but we've decided to update you. Look, we actually have got one new state to, to report because that's just come out five minutes ago and that's... Uh, actually, no, we'll tell you about that in a moment. That's Arkansas, but we'll tell you about that in a moment. Anyway, I want to run through the two close to calls because you know, we've been saying so long, this is where the election will be decided. We've got Virginia, first of all, here. And just... A word of caution, when you see these uh, percentage bars here, it looks there like Mitt Romney's actually got quite a solid lead. So why are we saying too close to call? Well, the precincts that have reported so far, 28% of them, we know those to be favouring uh, Republican areas. So that's why you get a split like that. Uh, let's move on now. Ohio, again, same sort of story here. You see a big split there like that. It's only 1% of precincts reporting with those 18 electoral college votes. North Carolina, which wasn't technically a swing state, but it's too close to call at this point and is close there. Three percentage points is the separation with 15% of precincts reporting. Way up to New Hampshire with its four electoral college votes. And again, just be careful with those those bar charts. I know it looks like Barack Obama has a big lead, but it's just the data we have favours him at the moment. We're waiting for more because, look, there's only 6% of the precincts. Let's go to the big one. Florida, 29 electoral college votes down there in the south. It is a lead of 200,000 votes at this point to Barack Obama with a third of precincts reporting. That's as tight as you'd expect it to be. You can really read something to that in that it is a very tight race there. Arkansas just wanted to put that on the board, make it official there. Arkansas, the projected winner, is Mitt Romney. 
with its six electoral college votes. So here's the tally. Here's the state of the race. 88 with Mitt Romney, 64 with Barack Obama, both men on their way. I will remind you of this every time on the way to 270 to win. Here's the map. Let's have a look. Just to give you an idea of how we're colouring up here. Remember, the map can be deceptive as well. Um, but you're actually looking at 10 states won by Mitt Romney. And even though there doesn't look like there's much blue on there, remember there's a whole stack of small states up here in the northeast. He's actually won nine states, Barack Obama. And we've got our one, two, three, four, five uh, too close to call states, which I was just telling you about before there. So the tally at the moment is 88, Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, 64, David. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kamal. Uh, live for us in Grant Park. And um, it's you, isn't it? Not many other, if anybody else there. <laughs> no, it's just me. Patty was talking a little while ago about the enthusiasm gap. Well, this is really a picture of that enthusiasm gap, the gap between Barack Obama of 2008 and Barack Obama in 2012. We're standing in the shadow of the Prudential Building, would be the shadow if it were daytime. Uh, that's where President Barack Obama's headquarters are, his campaign headquarters. And, of course, there's no one here where four years ago there were 250,000 people crowding this small space. Now, the president, in fairness, has moved this celebration indoors to a smaller venue. But there's also the lack of the vibrancy that you see throughout the city of Chicago. It seems very much like just another night. And remember, four years ago, many of the people who were out here were African-Americans for the first time witnessing the election of the first African-American president. And, and now there's not that sense of history. And the president is no longer talking in the lofty terms that he did four years ago. At that time, he was talking about hope and change. And now he's really been belittling Mitt Romney, talking about Romnesia and how uh, Romney has forgotten that he's changed his position so many times. Uh, the people we've talked to have been enthusiastic, but much more defensive about the president. And that's because the president has a record. He's no longer talking about changing the tone in Washington because he is Washington. So it's not the same as you would see uh, four years ago, not just here in Grant Park, but throughout the city of Chicago. Nevertheless, the people we've talked to have been largely enthusiastic about the president. It's just not the same enthusiasm we saw four years ago. John, thank you very much indeed. Valiant stuff, considering there's nobody else there um, but you. We'll be back when the crowds are a little bit bigger. That's John Hendren in, in Grant Park. And you did see the pictures there of, of what it was like four years ago. Is, is that a, a reflection, Jason, do you think, of, of changing attitudes or is it just too early. Look, I mean, you're not as excited about the same car four years later. You know, when it was new, it was great, and then four years later, you're not as excited Particularly about it. Particularly if it's broken down. Exactly. If it's broken down, then it wasn't quite as nice as when you thought you bought it. So, yeah. I, I'm not that surprised that people are less enthusiastic about Barack Obama, but I've always said that less enthusiasm for Obama doesn't necessarily translate into people liking Mitt Romney more. And because that's to, to take it another stage further, that, that's an even older model that you may not have liked in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, I think that's one of the challenges that we're seeing tonight. And one of the things that's interesting about young voters is it's also very hard to poll them. People tend to underestimate because over 70 percent of Americans under the age of 30 don't have landlines. And a lot of polling agencies never even find out how young people are going to vote. So I, I'm not surprised that young people are turning out at higher numbers in ways we didn't expect. That's extraordinary. What was the figure again? It's 70 percent of voters under people under the age of 30 in America no longer have landlines in their homes. So it's very hard for a lot of polling companies to even get in touch with those people because you can't get access to their cell phones. Well, but, in, in fairness, some of the polling companies, as you well know, have made adjustments and have included right. cell phone users in their polling. But um, uh, in general, you are totally right. This is this and the early voting are two of the things exactly. that have very much um, changed our perception of how accurate the polls are. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to see how much that that uh, uh, how good they really were as a result of all that. And, and the, the youth vote, you didn't get a chance to say anything. I know you were keen to. Right, right. Well, here's the thing. You know, America is getting younger. America is getting browner. America is getting more tan. And, and those are trends that tend to help the Democratic Party. And I think there's always been this sort of belief of people asking young people if they're unenthusiastic rather than asking if they're going to vote. And I think that's a, a, whether you're going to vote is more important than how enthusiastic you are, because when you pull the lever, you pull the lever. Okay.
Uh, are you getting any indication of the way this is going, or are we just sort of sitting here treading water? I think we're treading water, but I think that it's important to note that what the campaigns are saying on both sides is everybody is trying to look good. Everybody wants to hold out until they see, you know, what the numbers really are. And it will cascade, probably, won't it? Well, which, I mean, a lot of what you're seeing in these in these early hours are the easy states. You know, the the ones that we know that we we know their demographics, we know their voting history, we know they tend to be red, they tend to be blue. They're easy to call early. I mean, keep in mind these are these are projected. Uh, the states that go into one column or another at this point are not usually because every single vote in that state's been counted. It's because they're easy to project. And so what we see as the night goes on is the states that are not easy to project, the ones that sort of the swing states that sit more towards the middle, uh, we have to wait a while to, to be certain enough to say they're leaning one way or, they're, uh, or, they're, or there's a projected win for one or the other. And it gets very technical. You start looking at county by county. You need to know what counties in each one of these swing states are important um, to be able to call them. Uh, Jason, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. I, I'm going to keep quiet in just a minute. Just introduce our, our next guest. That's former Florida Governor Charlie Crist, endorsed Obama back in August. Uh, Governor, good to have you on the program. I, I normally ask the first question here, but I, I'm going to ask Jason here uh, to put the first one to you. He, he's more part of the American political scene, and he'll know where to start. <laughs> well, uh, Governor, uh, it, it's good to speak to you. The, okay, the, great. The, the first question that I have tonight is, how much of an impact do you think uh, the massive lines of people and the people being turned away, do you think that could actually end up making a difference in Florida? Or do you think the state's going to go to either Romney or Obama, regardless of what's happening in those districts? Well, I, I think ultimately, Jason, it's going to go to President Obama. I think that people are frustrated by the fact that these long lines exist. They shouldn't have to, after all. I mean, we had early voting four years ago when I was governor of 14 days. Uh, it's been reduced by the legislature and the governor of Florida to eight days this go round, and and for no really good reason. And so it, it's it's frustrating to people in my state. They're upset about it, but I also think they're motivated by it. You know, whenever somebody tells you you can't do something, you are become determined to do something. And I I think their frustration and in, infuriation with it has motivated them and made them uh, much more uh, apt to go ahead and finish the job, stay in the line, and get the vote done. And I think that will uh, eventually help President Obama. And in fact, Governor, when you kept the polls open, a lot of Republicans, uh, they didn't really forgive you for doing that. Uh, does it work to the advantage of one party in particular? Right. <clears throat> well, who knows for sure? I mean, that, that's a hard thing to make a scientific determination about. But you're right. Uh, some of my former fellow Republicans were not happy, happy about the fact that I extended the hours, but I, I look at public uh, office in a particular way that, you know, once you get elected, you're not the governor for the Republicans of your state, or are you the governor for the Democrats of your state? You're the governor for the people of your state or the president of your country. And you got to do what's right for all of them, uh, no matter what the circumstances might be or what the political consequence may be. And so my decision was a fairly easy one. A lot of senior citizens, a lot of people in Florida four years ago, we're waiting in long lines, so I signed an executive order to make sure that the line, that the polls rather stayed open longer, and they had the chance to exercise this precious right to vote. A uh, quick one before I, I hand over to Lynn Sherb, who's worked for ABC for so many years, but, uh, but a quick one for you, <laughs> Governor, from me. Um, if, if Mr. Obama gets back to the White House, what job would you like with him? Uh, Citizen Chris uh, is the job that I'm enjoying very much right now. I work for a great law firm in Florida, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, Governor Lynchur here. I wonder if... But um, thanks for asking, David. <laughs> I wonder, I'll come back to you on that one. I wonder if you have thought at all about... Yeah, sure. Uh, I wonder if you've thought at all about what effect your extending voting hours in Florida and so much of what's going on around the rest of the country in the wake of, uh, of uh, Sandy, the storm Sandy, might have on future voting rules in this country. We've always been a country with one day voting, 24 hours over the past number of elections. That's been expanded somewhat. Do you see this as leading to a different form of voting in the United States? Well, who knows for sure, but I do think that the early voting, uh, voting by uh, mail, absentee voting, if you will, I think those are positive things. And I think the idea and the objective should always be 
to make it as simple as possible for, for people to exercise their right to choose their leaders. Um, and, and this is what's been happening uh, except for this year. Uh, and there's been a throwback, if you will. Um, rather than going forward, there's, there's been a move backward by several states uh, throughout the country. And I think that's a sad situation. And I think it's frustrating to people. And I think it's simply wrong. Uh, just, a, just a quick one from me t to end, Governor. And it, it, it's a bit left field, uh, considering where we've been going during the rest of this interview. If Mitt Romney does become president, uh, and we're, I'm talking foreign affairs here, do you imagine that American troops might be kept in Afghanistan uh, longer than the, the present deadline set by President Obama at the end of 2014? Uh, hard to say, David. I really don't know. I can only tell you this, that, that what Governor Romney has said during the course of the campaign is that he would want to give $2 trillion more to the Department of Defense when they're not even asking for that much. And, you know, I don't know if that is, you know, an attempt to sound tough or what that's all about. Um, but I know what the president uh, wants to do. He wants to get out by 2014. He's already out of Iraq. Um, you know, the president speaks the truth. He says what he means, and he means what he says. Governor, thank you very much indeed. As I did mention, um, it's going to be a difficult one for whoever's going to be president. That's Charlie Crist, former governor of Florida there. Uh, yeah, Afghanistan. U.S. troops due to come home by the end of 2014. Uh, but a spate of insider killings this year has put the country's security in doubt. It'll be difficult for whoever occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Here's Bernard Smith in Afghanistan. After 10 years of conflict, Helmand remains the deadliest province for foreign and Afghan forces. More than 740 NATO soldiers have died here, most of them from Britain and the US. That's according to the International Security Assistance Force. Those sacrifices helped wrest vast swathes of Helmand from Taliban control, but not all of it. Would you like to see foreign forces stay after the end of 2014? Yes, the schedule is very tight and it gives us little time. If it had been a bit longer, it would have been better. But despite this, we have prepared ourselves for this schedule. These police have been patrolling on their own without the help of NATO forces for about a year now, and they say they're happy to carry on doing that. But this is the sort of area of Helmand province, rural areas, that remain vulnerable. And there are fears that the Taliban is just waiting out the withdrawal of NATO forces. Today we pause to honor our coalition force and Afghan security forces members who made the supreme contribution for Afghanistan this week. This is a weekly memorial service at ISAF headquarters in Kabul. George O'Connor, 40 commando. Four of Marine. the seven foreign soldiers who died in this week were murdered by men in Afghan uniforms. ISAF has acknowledged some Taliban infiltration of Afghan security forces. Second. So if the essential training of Afghans is to continue, the next US president will have to stomach the grim prospect of more insider killings. Mush. We thought about quantity, not quality, and the rush to build up our security forces. It's clear that the enemy probably planted a few infiltrators to sow mistrust. Now we're working on weeding out such people from the security forces. On the banks of the Helmand River in Lashkagar, there's time to enjoy the sunset. The Taliban was pushed out of here three to four years ago. The White House has said that after 2014, only if Kabul is threatened, will U.S. troops intervene. Mitt Romney insists he will make sure hard-fought gains are not lost. He's not said what he's prepared to do to prevent that. Bernard Smith, Al Jazeera, Helmand, Afghanistan. Let's examine that in more detail. We go back to Washington, D.C. after the view from Kabul and Shia Britans. Thanks, David. Yes, I'm joined by Professor of Foreign Policy Hillary Mann Leverett at American University, John Fury, Republican strategist. What was so interesting about the campaign, though, was a major decision by President Obama to surge forces into Afghanistan, and even by NATO's own metrics, a major failure as commander in chief. Mm -hmm. uh, Taliban attacks higher than before, in fact. The political space that was supposed to be created clearly wasn't created, and yet Mitt Romney didn't go after President Obama on this. It, it, why, why do you think that is? Is it simply because they have very similar policies? Well, uh, there's two reasons. First of all, Romney wanted to keep the focus on the economy because he, he felt he was much better branded as someone who could fix the economy. And second, 
he understands that the war in Afghanistan is unpopular, that voters want to pull, get out of Afghanistan as soon as possible. Going to the right of Romney on Afghanistan didn't make much political sense, especially later on during to, the campaign. To the right of Obama. But going to write Obama, I'm yeah. sorry. Right. Uh, is it clear, though, how Hillary and Obama, the two candidates, do differ on Afghanistan right now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think for, for President Obama, he realizes that his surge, sending tens of thousands of young American men and women into Afghanistan, was a mistake. It was a mistake that he should, he should be held accountable for, but it was a mistake, and one that Romney, to his credit, decided not to get behind. What's interesting is whether, what will Romney do next? Will he support a political resolution to the conflict in Afghanistan? Will he support talking to the Taliban? That'll be an interesting question. One other difference will be how, how ambitious, how aggressive Will Romney be in persecuting this war in Pakistan, on Pakistani territory? Very much to the right in our political spectrum, Obama staked out in 2008 his determination to violate Pakistan's sovereignty and persecute a war, a drone war in Pakistan, regardless of what the Pakistanis uh, cared or said about it. Romney has been pretty, um, has withheld judgment on that, whether he would violate the sovereignty in the same way, in increase the drone war in the same way that Obama has. It'll be interesting to see whether he actually continues that if he's elected president, that kind of hesitancy, holding back on just going into someone else's country. Do you detect that debate in, in the Republican Party? Well, the final chapter is currently being etched on who will be the next president of the United States of America. Continuous coverage, incisive coverage right here on headlines today. Currently, of course, uh, counting underway in the U.S. presidential elections, and it is a seesaw contest is what we are getting to know, with Republican challenger Romney leading as per the latest trends, according to latest information. Romney is now leading with 88 electoral votes as against 78 of Democrat incumbent Barack Obama. After lagging behind initially, Barack Obama closed in on the lead, in fact, surging ahead till a short time back with results. Of counting in states like Texas, Oklahoma coming in, Romney has picked up pace once again, surging a little ahead of Obama. Still, it is a neck-to-neck -neck fight. Uh, I've just finished writing uh, a victory speech. Uh, it's about 1,118 words, um, and uh, I'm sure it'll change before I'm finished because I haven't passed it around to my family and, and, uh, and friends and advisors to get their reaction. Uh, but I've only written one speech at this point. Well, it will boil down to the swing state uh, for now. Very close call in both Ohio, Virginia and even Florida. We're going to get you constant coverage on that. But uh, let's cut across to know what the trends are. Let's uh, listen in to Al Jazeera. Very red indeed. Uh, the split is 17 states to uh, Mitt Romney, 12 to Obama. Is it 13 now with New York? I'm just hearing New York has just gone to and New Mexico as well. I'm being told these are about falling to Barack Obama as well. So that changes the Electoral College too. Bear with me. 154 for Mitt Romney and 114 for Barack Obama. That is the latest Electoral College score. 154 Mitt Romney, 114 Barack Obama. Kamal, th thanks very much. Indeed, and of course all the yellow being the, the swing states, the ones that um, both sides were playing for. O on the basis, uh, to the panel again here, on the, on the basis that news is something that surprises you. This isn't news, is it? Uh, no, uh, except for, well, no, not surprising in the, in, the, in the critical sense of the word. But Michigan going to Obama is, a, is an interesting development in that there were three states in the closing days of this campaign that, uh, the, that the Romney camp uh, claimed that they wanted to expand the map and make a play for. And they were Pennsylvania, uh, which, which we've talked about tonight, um, and, and Michigan was one of them, and Wisconsin. And so Michigan going to Obama is an indication that this expand the map strategy, um, at least in one place, is not working for Romney. You've been you poring over your, your tablets and your, your, your tiny little phones yeah. over there, just <laughs> yeah. getting the information in from all right. your particular right. sources. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing then? I'm hearing that in Florida, the Latino vote, the youth vote, the black vote are very strong for President Obama. That um, and and these are indications, whatever happens, that the Republican Party needs to start looking at their own party and figure out 
how to expand their base. It's exactly what Jason said earlier, uh, the younger, browner, beiger, blacker colors of uh, the populace. Uh, the Republican Party needs to take more of this uh, uh, into accord. I think we should also, if I may, just look at two uh, center, interesting Senate races. Angus King, former governor of Maine and independent, has won handily um, the Senate race in Maine, replacing Olympia Snow, very moderate Republican, who's retiring. And Angus King has not yet declared who he will caucus with, whether it will be the Democrats or the Republicans. He's a, officially an independent. He must declare in order to get a committee assignment. And everybody assumes it will be with the Democrats, but he could very well be a, a big player in the Senate. One other to look at um, that just was interesting on colorful uh, reasons uh, in Connecticut, uh, the Linda McMahon, uh, she and her husband had built up this world wrestling entertainment uh, uh, business, has lost to uh, Chris Murphy. Uh, she was the she is the Republican. He's the Democrat. We are all under orders in this room to have our phones on silent, but, but, but not, no, 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 it was very quiet. But the strange thing was, I thought something was happening to me. The table yeah, was I elevating. Started to vibrate. <laughs> but Jason is so plugged in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was very, very strange. It was, it was a quiet one. I didn't know what was going to happen, actually. I, I, I had it on mute. I had it on mute. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Well, I, I've been hearing a lot, of course, from Ohio. That's, that's a place where I'm actually an early voter. And, and there's some interesting demographic numbers we've got right now. Uh, Barack Obama right now with the exit polls, he's at about 42 percent of the white vote, pretty much what he had uh, in 2008. But it's interesting. The percentage of white voters as the overall population in Ohio dropped from 83 to 79 in just four years, uh, which means, again, these turnout numbers of, uh, amongst this sort of younger, more diverse America might end up pushing this state over the edge for Barack Obama. And it just just to make just to underscore that um, uh, last time around, uh, the president did not win the white vote. He won the minority vote. And and it's it, the question is how that balance balances out, and if he gets enough minority vote to overcome the the uh, discrepancy in the white vote. Okay, um, we're going to go to our correspondents who who are in Chicago and Boston, the, the the headquarters for the night for the for the two campaigns, and I've been trying my best to think about what to ask them when when not very much has come through so far. So let's bring up uh, Paddy Culhane in Chicago and Alan Fisher, who's in Boston, and I'm going to throw it open to our panelists here. Who wants to start? Well, I'll actually start. This is Jason. Yes, uh, I'll actually start with, uh, with, with Patty. So my, my real question, Patty, is, you know, how excited are people? I know this is a generic question, but what I really want to know is, are they excited because they think Obama's going to win? Are they excited because they're already talking about the second term? Um, or is it sort of a, a nervous anticipation? What, what's the, what, how would you describe the excitement at the Obama headquarters right now? Jason, I thought you were going to ask something much harder than that. After all, I've given you that nickname that I'll let you tell everybody else what it is. No, I can tell you. I, <laughs> it's nerd. Okay. It's not going to be a private show. It's on national TV. Because uh, he knows a lot of this math down to like the county level. International, dear. Uh, I can tell you I've been all over the country. And it's not just the campaign supporters. It's all Americans. The sense that I'm getting from people is that they're really frightened. You talk to Republicans, they're absolutely terrified of what Barack Obama would do with the second term. You talk to Democrats, they're living in fear of what Governor Romney would do in office. Now, truthfully, if you look at what this campaign has been about, it's been very little about any sort of substance that both of the campaigns have just put out there. Oh, I'm going to create 12 million jobs. We're going to have energy independence. Nobody's actually talked about what they're going to do, how they're going to solve the financial problems that both of the campaigns say they have to do something about. Really, if you think about what the campaign has come down to, it's about these campaign ads. And all they're doing is trying to paint the opponent as something to be afraid of. We saw that attack from President Barack Obama in his final days in the stump. And that's why he kept saying, you know me, you know what I'll do, because the campaign is purposefully trying to put that in people's heads that you can't trust Governor Romney. And all the people I talked to, especially in Ohio, again, where the people were really feeling like they'd like this election to be over a year ago, what they were telling me is those who were going to vote for Obama were doing it because they were leaning away from Governor Romney. I think that is very telling. 
this is not the campaign of 2008. In many ways, Barack Obama has been running against his former self, trying to rekindle some sort of hope and change without giving any specifics. So he's a time struggle to defend his record. Uh, the campaign, though, is done. They have moved on the president's eating dinner, by the way, right now. But while I've got you, David, I forgot to tell you what the president did that was so funny when he went to the uh, phone bank. He picked up a coffee and he drank it. He said, that's not my coffee. And he looked at the volunteer and he said, uh, you don't have a cold or anything, do you? <laughs> it's been a long road. The candidates are exhausted. They want this over with. And the last thing the president needs is a cold. Because I can tell you every single member of the White House press corps has one. So, what is this Matty, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm giving up responsibility for asking sensible questions because they're being asked by other people uh, with me here. Jennifer Lovin, it's Alan Fisher for you. Alan's in, in Boston. Hi, Fire Alan. Um, good, good to see you on this side of the camera. Um, you know, a lot of the talk going, as you very well know, going into these last days is about which, which side is bluffing. And, and as, as we both know well, uh, campaigns like to play the confidence game, talk about what they think is is going to happen and, and put the most positive spin on it. What's your best guess as to whether the Romney camp is bluffing about its chances, both in the, in the ground game, in turnout, in the this expand the map strategy into Pennsylvania? What's your assessment? Uh, as far as the ground game is concerned, there's no doubt that the Republicans have sharpened up their operation. It is much better than it was four years ago. They knew they had to match Barack Obama's efforts of 2008. That was because they performed perhaps the best get-out-the-vote operation that America has ever seen. They were slightly hampered by the fact that it took them so long to decide on Mitt Romney as the candidate. Now, as for expanding the map, well, I think the idea of Michigan going to Mitt Romney, even though he was born there, his father was a very popular governor there, was perhaps wishful thinking. And I think even uh, the Romney campaign knew that. They believe that they have a better chance, perhaps, in Pennsylvania. It's interesting here in the hall that people have been cheering the fact that Mitt Romney is now projected at 50% of the vote in Florida. You remember the, uh, the Romney campaign just a week or so ago was saying that they were going to win very heavily in Florida, particularly with those voting on the day. So David Axelrod, who is Barack Obama's main political advisor, said, well, come November the 6th, we'll see who's bluffing. I think perhaps the Romney campaign may have overplayed their hand, particularly with the expand the map strategy. I think they realize they have lost Ohio. They need to get Pennsylvania. According to the latest projections we're watching on the big screen here, they're slightly ahead in Virginia. But if they're tied in Florida, they're behind in Ohio, and they can't win Pennsylvania. So it looks as if that uh, the firewall that Barack Obama was building up in the Midwest, his uh, route to 270, may well be protected. People here are still cheering. There's still an air of confidence. But I think uh, there was a bigger cheer for the fact there was a projection that the Republicans may keep control of Congress than there was for any of the other projections that we saw of Mitt Romney winning what were always going to be guaranteed Republican states.